So hi guys and welcome to the next Triton videos. Um, today with a feature, with a French feature actually. <laughs> um, Vincent Chalier is with us today because a lot of people asked us actually if we can do a video about um, corals and, and coral farming, right? And um, Vincent Chalier is actually the king of coral farming as far as I know. So um, we put your question directly to him and he will answer all of them as good as he can, I think. I try my best. Yeah, <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> Possibly you can do it a bit, a bit better than me, but it's all right. So um, I would say we just started from here and hope that you enjoyed. Okay, guys. So first question is um, by Alex asking, is it possible to get, do you think it's possible to get corals in the aquarium as colorful as you get them actually out of the ocean? Okay, so... Um I think we don't exactly know the answer to that. What we know is uh, coral are habitat specific, so they come from many different habitats. And uh, so an aquarium is only one habitat. So there is corals inside that come from the same habitat and uh, they will get colorful in it. And there are corals that are not coming from the same habitat that won't get so well inside. So actually some corals get better coloration in the aquarium, some corals don't get as good. Uh, we're trying to find out, and this is uh, what we've been working with Triton, is to sample water, and especially with the NDOC analysis right now, we can, we, we can discover things and, and try to find the sweet spot of coral coloration, you know, in each different habitat. So we can translate this into parameters in the aquarium. Uh, yeah, I think uh, some coral will do very well in aquarium. We will be able to color them as good or maybe better than they are in the ocean. But some coral will struggle a little bit in aquarium. Okay, thanks for that. I think it's pretty, pretty good question. I hope Alex is happy with it. Yeah. Um, it I just one thing from my side. So, do you think that when when we actually get more knowledge to all the the stuff that we do? Um, that we can adapt the aquarium better or do you think like because we're mixing up anyway you know what I mean like um, all the corals anyway um, the habitats will never match that all the corals will look good you know what I mean yeah so I think aquarium I mean if you want to get the best result you will have to focus on one particular habitat where all the corals are coming from the same place so you will do an aquarium with acropora from offshore reefs and you will have perfectly clear water with just a little bit of nutrients and just a little bit of nutrients and and they will do well we see this on the reef you know not all the corals on the same reef there is only one place where they are very colorful because this is the only place where they get the puff the perfect parameters they get everything they need in one spot and 100 meters away there is something missing and they don't get as colorful so yeah so we need to discover you know what is the difference between all those habitats okay so the next question we have actually um some of you asked us is how sustainable is mari culture of corals really um i think regarding the if there are any projects or just do you cut off um wild corals glue them on and then sell them on that's something that wouldn't be that yeah. kind of you know so um, in that regards how, how how sustainable my culture is really okay so I mean first of all you have to understand we've been doing this for over 20 years so we start to understand you know all the process uh, from the beginning we wanted to do it properly you know so we were the first one to actually produce broodstock colony so before we sell any coral we start to produce mother colony and after we take some frags from those mother colonies and then we grow them and this is what we sell some of those frags we plant back to the reef so we actually the, i have plenty of examples like acropora robusta where uh, i took some few uh, frags from one colony in the wild and we have now mother colonies which are maybe 10 times bigger than actually the, the original colony <laughs> and uh, in, in in our farm in chanidasa we've been replanting few of those Acropora robusta. So actually the mother colony originally, you know, is a very small compared to some of the colonies we have planted around. So this is one point. The other point is uh, some racks, we just let them grow. Usually what happens is after four or five years, the racks is completely overgrown and uh, we have to break everything up and start all over again. So then we can count each mother colony exactly instead of one big block 
we have all the different mother colonies separated. So uh, because we are audited regularly, we need to be able to count everything. So every four or five years we break everything. But on some few colonies, we didn't do that. We just let them grow. And now I have racks which are 18 years old and which are as big as a truck. <laughs> so we created some reef where there wasn't any reef, actually. You know, so that's, that's one part. There is one other part is that uh, uh, most of the business right now is, is getting wide calls and chopping them down. I don't think this is sustainable. Even if you create as many aquarium coral as possible from one single mother colony, you know, there is no, the collection of the mother colony of the original colony from the reef is not sustainable. So my culture is probably, to my understanding, is the only sustainable way of doing it. Or growing uh, culture and corals in close system yeah. in here or in the US or in Europe or anywhere but stop collecting wild corals that's the only way to go okay next question I might uh, somebody's asking about education so mm. she, he's uh, okay she's saying uh, for her education is really sustainable so yeah. the practical part of the of the business is it's quite a long question so I'll just yeah. try to translate it um, the practical part of the business is fine you know fragging and the, the project kind of 30% out to the sea and stuff but um, she's saying that if you don't educate people mm. um, that will not lead over long term like because something yeah. you know money wise so is there any um, she's asking is there any educational thing that she also could kind of be part of yeah. um, that you carrying out in Bali in Indonesia or maybe in Australia or somewhere um, to, to educate people how how like all the stuff that you developed mm. right in the past how the techniques would actually um, end up yeah. in an educational program so uh, it's been many years uh, people uh, ask us to visit the coral farm that we were doing you know and um, I never wanted to just open the coral farms to people and then uh, actually coral farm are a beautiful tool to educate people so a couple of years ago, we came up with the idea to create this Ocean Gardener program where we use our coral farm to educate people because people will only protect things that they understand or know a little bit of it. So if we don't educate people about coral reef, if we don't educate people about corals, they won't protect it. So the idea is it's a coral farm, so we are fragging corals, we are cutting corals. So it's it's a, the coral farm is actually a beautiful tool where I can I like my guests to actually touch the corals. They are from farming, it's fine, and so they can really understand, you know, the, the, the difference between hard coral and soft coral and why it's not good to step on them or why it's not good to handle yeah. them. Yeah. But actually they also understand that corals are pretty strong and they can with withstand quite a lot of things. And it's only the addition of many, many different uh, threats that we give them that is making them lose the battle. So, yeah, so the coral farm is actually a beautiful tool to educate people and educate kids. So that's what we're trying to achieve. With, we've opened one of our farms. We created some other farms in resorts where actually people can plant corals, produce corals and replant corals on a reef. So that's what we're trying to achieve with Ocean Gardener. So yeah, I can just recommend to go and check out Ocean Gardener. If you're planning to go to Bali, you know, you, that's actually a quite nice thing yeah. to go to have a look at because before that it was actually hidden. So yeah. you could go there by, you know, that by luck and, and hit mm. one of them. But right now it's actually open to you guys. So you better go and check out. So I think we go for the next question, isn't it? So oh, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're trying to do this in, in, in many places, not only in Bali, you know, but also in, uh, in Manado and, and why not here in Australia or in other places, you know. So the, the target is to open coral farm from all around the world, everywhere where there is tourist and coral farm, you know, then people can learn about corals. Yeah. Next one, not too serious question this time. <laughs> Sorry for that. But the next question is actually, uh, what is your favorite acropora? I think that's something that you get asked very often. Yeah, I'm asked this very often and it's not an easy answer to uh, to to reply because it's always the last acropora that you've seen, you know. So, But but I have few f some few favorites, you know. One of them is acropora swarsonois because uh, I lived a long time in Bali and it's originally from Bali. It has very particular shape. It does very well in aquarium, so it's one of my favorite. 
Uh, another one would be Acropora locani because of the same reason, deep water Acropora grows in a beautiful shape, beautiful purple coloration. So it's, it's one. I love also Millepora because it's challenging and it's feeding a lot and, it, and, and everybody's want it. There's so many different coloration. You can make one aquarium only with Milleporas. And then finally, the last one that I would say, you know, would be Tenuis because Tenuis is the Acropora that do the best in aquarium. It, 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 it's better in aquarium than on a reef, you know, so it's very, it's a very successful aquarium coral. So that's why it's one of my favorite. Yeah. So actually you cannot answer this question. I cannot stop answer it. this question. There is 124 <laughs> species of Acropora, you know, okay. so I can go through all of them. Okay, next question. <laughs> So next question is actually out of Germany. So um, somebody is asking, saying like we know about a lot of things in plastic in the ocean, that it's actually dangerous for the humans, and we hear about it and we see everything about it in in you know TV. Um, he's just asking a question, saying is it also a threat to coral reefs? Because that's nobody talking about. They're talking yeah. about food and stuff. So what do you think? Because you're actually in Bali. Um, is it is it a problem? So, uh, yes, so uh, Indonesia is the second biggest producer of plastic. So, yes, we do see a lot of plastic in Indonesia. Uh, everybody has seen those videos during the rainy season in Bali, you know, with people diving with mantares and plastic all over the place. So, yes, we do see a lot of plastic and there is not one single time where I go and check on my corals on my reef and uh, plant some new corals where I don't come back with a few baskets of plastics. Uh, plastic wrapping corals around, uh, pieces of material wrapping corals around. So we always come back for many dives with a lot of plastics. So yes, it's a big problem and I really appreciate for all the companies in Europe, you know, that actually try to do something about it. It's, uh, it, it's pretty important and I find the aquarium industry, you know, not really aware about this problem and not doing their share to find solution for this problem. Thanks a lot. So, actually sad, sad question, but need to be answered. Yeah. Going for the next one. Okay, next question is actually a guy from the UK. He's asking um, about LPS and light. Yeah. So he's actually asking uh, because a lot of people have LPS uh, in the aquarium, just LPS kind of, and then they try to just uh, illuminate them with blue light. Yes. Um, is that okay for that coral or do you think uh, it's very important to give them a full spectrum of light? Yeah, so I think uh, for LPS actually food is more important than light. So uh, to use weak blue light on LPS is perfectly fine as soon as you feed your corals properly. Uh, we do produce a lot of LPS for many years. We usually put them pretty deep so they don't receive so much light. Or if we put them more shallow, we shade them with uh, different materials, with different nets. And, uh, but we always make sure we put them in a place where they receive sufficient food. You know? So the current is very important. The way uh, the current is made, we are making sure that every time there is a low tide or something, you know, they just bath in a soup of food and they have a lot of food available for them. You know? So food is the main factor regarding uh, LPS in aquarium, I think. Yeah, so also we find actually out that um, the end of testing helps quite a lot to understand these the systems. Yeah. So um, we, that's something that we're working on right now to find out if, um, if the food sources actually, you can find them on the end dock. Mm. So to find out how the ways, the pathways are in the reef. Yeah. So actually that's something that maybe in future will be revealed mm. to us to, to the, actually the hard work that we're doing together. Yeah, actually, you know, I mean, there is one, everybody thinks that uh, the, the water surrounding coral reef is actually poor. Okay, it's poor in nutrients, it's poor in nitrogen, in phosphorus, in all those nutrients. But it's rich in nutrient, you know, it's just, it, it's recycled all the time. It goes from one animal to another all the time, all the time. So if you do a night dive on a reef, you would see that there is plenty of food available. Shrimp, fish, plankton, whatever, you name it, there is so much food available for corals. Yeah even though the water itself contains very little nitrogen or carbon or anything. So yeah, so it's not because the reef, the water is very poor in nutrients that actually coral don't feed, they need a lot of food. Yeah. Next question. It's actually a very practical question. Yeah. So somebody is asking us, it was a long question again, but I will, I will just break it down. Somebody is asking us, he's going into the shop and want to buy a coral and it's, it's actually brown. So where 
actually can he know that this coral will turn in a blue coral later on that's what the shopkeeper tells him yeah. and he's afraid to buy it yeah. so um so he's asking if is there any possibility to to know that you know this is not a really brown coral in the sea yeah. um it's a colored coral that went brown because of shipment and stuff and then will turn colorful again in his aquarium so yeah so um this is obviously a very good advantage of my culture because uh, we grow all the frags from uh, the same colony. So we know exactly the potential of each colony. You know? So when you buy a myculture coral, you know actually that you are buying a colorful coral. Even if it's stressed out a little bit during shipping and lost some coloration and is a little bit pale, we don't grow any brown corals. <laughs> if you go on the reef, when I, make, when I receive guests on my, on my farms, this is what I explain them when I bring them to my artificial reef, I would say, this is not what a real coral reef looks like. Most of the coral, 95% of the corals are actually brown. But we selected those 5% of corals which are, which are colorful and we grown them. So we don't grow any brown corals, we grow only colorful corals. So when you actually buy my cultured corals, you always buy colorful corals. So you always have a chance that your corals will become more colorful if you find the sweet spot. So this is also one thing that we've been working on with, with Triton for over 10 years now, is trying to find the sweet spot, trying to find the elements that encourage color and produce more colorful in your, in your corals. So when you buy my culture corals and you have the right condition in your aquarium, you find the sweet spot, automatically it will become colorful again. So yeah, when you buy uh, wild corals, you don't know what you get. That's it. Yeah. That's I think a very important point. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 quite quite sad. But if you buy a wild coral and it's brown, you can't actually say what it will get. It will. It's probably colorful. You just don't know what color it's gonna be. Okay. Let's go to the next question then. Yeah. So okay, last question, my friend. Yeah. Um, it's actually about a very simple question. What is the most important thing somebody need to look at? Your in your opinion when it's coming up to like a coral husbandry in an aquarium? Okay, so uh, what I think is uh, stability is the main thing that we need to look at. It's not about once a month, you know, cleaning up all the aquarium and, and going through a lot of change. This is gonna stress the coral. It's about stability, you know, so it's about plenty of little course of daily course that you need to do, you know, to keep your aquarium in perfect condition. Uh, so yeah, that's where Triton is very good for. It's, it's stability, you know, so you just have to, to dose the right amount and check your KH and just <laughs> increase the dosing okay, okay. or reduce the dosing, enough that's all. Ad enough advertising, enough ad thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah, that was actually the last question. Yeah. So if you guys have another question actually um, coming up into your mind and you get us an email to, you know, the video at triton.de and we will get this guy out of Bali again. Actually, there is something I like to add, you know, yeah, go. it's when you look at the ocean, the ocean is not stable. There is plenty of parameters that always fluctuate in the ocean, depending on the tide, the visibility in the water, the, 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 the load of nutrients, of nutrients is always going to fluctuate. If it is, if there is ocean water coming in at high tide, then it's going to be clear water. If it is low tide, then you will have dirty water, the current, the moon. The temperature, everything fluctuates. In aquarium, we are able to keep the coral in much stable conditions. So we actually should be able to get better result with coral in aquarium that we get actually in the ocean. So it's just we need more discipline and we need to get on it, you know, and, and really stick to our our small little core every day, you know, to keep the condition as perfect as possible. So am I allowed to end it now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. I actually like very much the eye tight. <laughs> okay, guys. So I hope you enjoyed that video and your questions are answered. Like I said, if you have more questions and I need to get this man again to Australia, I will do it. Yeah. So if you enjoyed the video, get us another question and we'll get him back. Yes. Take care, guys. See you later. See you, guys. Bye.